host for the program Coming Home. We began by meeting at uh, a hotel in the ballroom and from there we, we uh, came upon a property that we are currently at today. And, and, and I get on them all the time. We have to change our thinking if we're ever going to walk in the kingdom of God. Well, hello and welcome again to today's program, Coming Home. And uh, if you're visiting us for the first time on television or online, the purpose of our program is to introduce viewers like yourself to local pastors and churches and ministries. And I am honored today to have a pastor from Cedar Rapids, and his name is Pastor Cimarron Dawson, and he pastors Living Waters Kingdom Church. And so I want to welcome you, Pastor Cimarron, Thank you, sir. to the program. And um, it's been, it took a little bit to get connected here, but I'm Absolutely. with you. But I am so glad to have you on the program today. And it's so good to have a pastor from Cedar Rapids. We're just looking, I told you that, we're looking yes, for more pastors from Cedar Rapids to come up and be on the program. But uh, we thank God for Christian television because Absolutely. it is my understanding there's 40 million. Uh, people that proclaim faith in Jesus Christ who do not attend a church. Wow. And, they're, and, and many of them are, are, aren't attending church for a variety of reasons, but some of them don't go to church because they don't know what church to go to. Absolutely. So this gives them an opportunity to meet the pastor and uh, to learn a little bit about his congregation and the ministries that they offer. So with that, uh, Pastor Simran, tell the people, look into the camera, and just tell them a little bit about who you are and how you came to know Christ and, and God's call to ministry on your life. Okay. Uh, my name is Simran Dawson. I am a very regular guy with a supernatural call. Um, I was raised in, uh, by a single mother, raised in the church, and Throughout my life growing up, I was taught a lot of religion, taught a lot of church, but really wasn't raised um, in a way that really helped me to know the real relationship with Christ that I would grow to find later on in my life. Um, I thank God for being raised by a strong Christian mother, um, but I was, it wasn't until I, about, I was about 12 or 13 years old that I was able to really come into relationship with Jesus Christ. I was saved under the ministry of my uncle, Pastor James Tony, Shekinah Glory Bible Fellowship. And I thank God that he uh, allowed me to know him in a real way, know him beyond the rituals of church, but really to have a real relationship with him that called for accountability, that called for sanctification. And I've just been tremendously blessed to, to grow in God and see God work in my life. Amen. You know, I hear that a lot from pastors when I have them on the program that um, when I ask them to share about uh, their growing up years and, and how they came to know Christ, and they will give the testimony that they attended church, but they didn't really have a personal, real relationship with Christ. And that is pretty common. And I think I could say that myself, that my parents did take me to church. I believed in the existence of God, and I knew He was real, but I didn't, know, I didn't even know that I could know Him. I didn't know Absolutely. I could have a personal relationship with Him and that is the good news. Absolutely. That is the good news. God, he made, it's, uh, it's gonna, this is going to air after the first of the year, but we're recording at Christmas time, and it's absolutely. Emmanuel, which is God God's with right. us. Yes, Amen. Absolutely. And I shared this Sunday morning in the service about, you know, I said, have you seen him? You know, have you seen him? And, and I said, when I look into the eyes of my grandchildren, I see him. And yeah. when I look into the eyes, and I mentioned different people, I see him. Because when we open our hearts to Christ and He comes and makes His home in us, through relationship, Absolutely. He becomes visible to the world, doesn't Absolutely. He? Absolutely. Yeah, He sure and does. And He brings to light the things that He put in us to be a blessing to others. Amen. Absolutely. You know, we're the only Jesus the world's going to see. Absolutely. Until He comes, yes. And to be, have, the, have the privilege of, of being a, His representative uh, or ambassador. The Bible calls us ambassadors. ambassadors. Absolutely. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, that's kind of like being Secretary of State, uh, except it's uh, a higher calling than being Secretary of State yes, or being an ambassador representing our country in a foreign country because we really are ambassadors for Christ representing Him in, a you might say, a foreign country, which Absolutely. is the world. <laughs> and you know what is so great to me, Roland, is the fact that such an awesome and perfect God chose someone so imperfect like me yeah. to represent him and I get the privilege of knowing him more every day yes. so that I can be more conformed to his image so that people when they see me they see him yes 
Isn't that what we want to, you know, and I was, it's so interesting, you said what you said there about God uses, you know, he just t takes us in perfect beings and, and uses us to display, put his glory on display through us. Absolutely. And I, as I was leaving home this morning, the thought came to me, God uses ordinary people. Absolutely. And I've been on your website, Pastor Simran, and I've seen about all the different, one of the, one of the um, uh, purposes or, or goals that you have for your fellowship or your, your church is to make everyone a, who wants to be a minister in some way mm -hmm. of the gospel. And, uh, but God, we don't have to be gifted. In fact, it's better if we're not gifted. I, that was the hardest thing for me when I got saved because I was a salesman and I was a pretty good salesman. And Absolutely. I found that I could, uh, I could do a pretty good job of selling Jesus to people. And then I found out that's not, and I had to become, I had to empty myself of those natural giftings in order to somewhat, in order to let the Holy Spirit do the work through Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the, one of the things that is very important to me, Roland, is that we understand that God needs touchable representatives. Yes. If you look at Jesus, one of the things that, that uh, is interesting to me is he would not have hung out with a lot of religious people because a lot of religious people feel like they cannot be touchable. They feel like they've ascended to some plane, they've transcended the level that everyone else is on, and it becomes a conflict because then the people that need to be reached say, I'm not good enough to yes. even reach, be reached by you, let alone Christ. How can Christ love me if I can't even get love from people down here? Wow. And you know, the word of God really convicts me because it reminds us uh, that uh, how can we love God whom we've never seen and not love the people that we see every day? And God needs representatives, people that have been through, uh, through everything. Because I believe in our church, one of the things I love uh, as the strength of our church is, uh, if it's something that happens to people, it's happened to somebody in our church. And we are a, a, a great gathering of people with great testimonies, people that have seen God work in spite of the challenges of life, that have seen God yes. use us in spite of what we see as our insecurities and our liabilities. And more than anything, seeing that a great big God puts something so great inside of us that no matter what we face in the world, greater is he that is in us <laughs> than he that is in the world. Absolutely. I get excited now. Me I too. can see we're going to preach to one another. I, it sounds morning. like it. Yes, sir. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, yeah. You know, it's you, you said that, that in, in, within your congregation, if it can happen to anybody, it's happened to one or more people in the church. Absolutely. God takes our past. He takes the brokenness of our lives and transforms us, and we become a living testimony Absolutely. of His love and His power both. And, um, you know, I was, I was heard, heard this recently that G, I think it was Bill Johnson, if you know who Bill Johnson is, okay, I the name from California, Redding, California, but he talked about that Jesus is in the gospel, that when the gospel is presented, Christ is re revealing himself to the person that we're presenting the gospel to. Absolutely. And I have, I've, when I heard that, I thought, that's what happens when I give my testimony. Absolutely. The power of a testimony. And so what you're saying is that each one of your people have experienced the healing, uh, delivering, transforming power of Christ in their life. And now they've got a story to tell. And they're still walking through the process of sanctification. I was yes. just talking uh, to the church about this the other day. Sanctification is a process that goes on throughout our life. We are constantly being drawn yes. closer to God. Um, and, and I think one of the things that is important about ministry in a time like this is people want to see that it works for us. We don't have the same culture of hand-me-down religion anymore where people just come to church because their parents took them to church. Yes. Now people make an intelligent choice. And that's why we have to have such a definitive uh, uh, showing of God's goodness in our own life yes, and the fact that he's doing a redemptive work in our own lives so that people when they see it they say if it can work for somebody like Cimarron see I'm not I'm not embarrassed about my testimony I've made a lot of mistakes in my life I've made a lot of bad decisions over the course of my life but if people can see that I've made bad decisions but I made a really good decision <laughs> yes. that overrides all of my bad decisions and yes. in spite of what they saw in my past God has given me a future in spite of what I've messed up in the past, God never let my, 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 my past be my liability. Yes. And I'm going to tell you one thing, Roland, and I get excited about this mess. I'm trying to keep <laughs> myself together. But the thing that people have to get to the place of is when you accept the new life in Christ, it is officially the funeral for the past. Oh, I like that. It is officially the day where you have to close the casket and say, I'm not going to view the body that we used to be anymore. <laughs> I'm going to move on. It's time for the repast. It's time for the celebration. And it's time for me to go into that abundant life that Jesus said he came. Amen. He said, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. 
Never said he was able. Said that's his purpose. But he said, I've come. Yes. That you might have life and life more abundant. Not, not, just, not just survival life, but overflowing life. And if somebody in the world that is lost and living a dead existence sees that much life on me, I guarantee it's going to start a conversation. It's catching. And if it starts a conversation, it's going to start a revolution. There you go. I like that. See, I'm stirred up oh, Me too. Me too. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the good news. You know, the, the gospel means good news. And uh, Luke 4.18 is the, the motto for, for, for what... Our church does, and that is we're to carry on the work that Jesus did. What did he do? He came to set at liberty those that were bound. That's absolutely right. You know, the world is, there's so many people that are bound with fears and guilt and bitterness and and resentment and and, uh, 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 drug addictions and different things. And Jesus came to set at liberty those that are bound. And he came to give recovery of sight to the blind. And I do believe that that can include physical healing. But I think what happens is that when we... Uh, Because I tried to read the Bible before I got born again and Mm -hmm. didn't understand it. But I tell you what, when when I was born again and God's Spirit came into me and I I read the Bible, my eyes were opened to be able to perceive the reality of His person and His presence. And and He came to heal broken hearts because there's a lot of broken hearted people. Absolutely. And he came to restore the, and pick up, that is to pick up and restore the lives of those whose lives have been beaten down by life. Absolutely. And the things that can happen in life. Well, the name of your church is Living Waters Kingdom yeah. Church. Absolutely. And I like that. I like that verse of Living Waters. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. And uh, I mean that name because it comes from Scripture. Jesus said, out of your belly will yeah. flow rivers of living water. Yes, sir. And, you know, that living water is there for us to drink every day. Absolutely. And he's in, in John chapter 8, he's, he says, He's speaking of the Spirit. Absolutely. He says, if any among you is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink, for out of his belly. I, I think that um, people hear this but haven't experienced it. And I tell you what, it's that encounter with God, that experience with God, that fullness of his Spirit is God's plan for every one of his children. Absolutely. Well, and you know, the woman at the well, she, uh, when Jesus met her, uh, there was something interesting that jumped out to me about that 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 encounter is she came there and said in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, to get some water mm-hmm. so that she could go back to uh, and be able to better cope with the drama of her life, the yes, trouble of her that's life. Good. She wanted to come there in a place where she wasn't around a whole bunch of critical people, mm-hmm. where she wasn't around a lot of people that were giving her condemnation and beating her down. But she was not trying to get healed of the problems in her life. She was just trying to cope with it. Jesus comes in and says, if you believe in me, if you can just trust me, I'm going to give you some water where you will never thirst again, which means I'm going to heal what's going on in your life, not just where you are at the moment. And what God is saying to to us in this day, I'm getting excited, I'm trying to hold it down, (laughs) is Christ wants us through the Holy Spirit to give us a life that where it won't matter what we're going through and what we're facing, that we are always, hallelujah, taken care of, that we always have yes. what we need. And you know what's also important is uh, uh, one, of the, one of the type and shadows uh, that water connects with in the Bible is, is the Holy Spirit and the fact that thirst and lack is a result of sin. That's right. Thirst and lack is a, is a result of the impact of the enemy. So Christ says, now I'm going to make the enemy a non-factor in your life. Oh, wow. Praise yeah, God. I, I feel like something's happening here. Uh, and, and when you understand that the Holy Spirit comes in such a way to remove that element, you know what blesses us? Is that means no matter what the enemy is doing, it's no longer my issue. There you no go. No matter what my transgenerational things that have been passed down, it's no longer my issue. Now, the only thing that can stop me, are you ready for this? Is when I refuse to drink of the water that I've been given. Oh, preach that. That is a fact, isn't it? That's right. So that doesn't mean it doesn't matter what my parents did. It doesn't it doesn't matter my socioeconomic condition. It doesn't matter uh, 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 where I live. If the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in me, I don't have to be thirsty. And you know what? When I'm not thirsty, I don't have to settle. When I'm not thirsty, I don't have to concede, but I can walk in the authority that I've been given. Amen. I can walk in power. I can have whatever I want. The Bible says, if I delight myself in him, he'll give me the desires of my heart. He'll tell me what to want. And, and when he tells me what to want, I know I'm going to get it. And that keeps me from thirsty. Oh, wow. Well, did you catch that? Well, that, we have to let that sink in, don't we? Yeah, because that yeah. is, that is the, the life um, that Christ has, has died and rose again to give us. Absolutely. Is abundant life and overflowing life. 
of good. Not that we're not going to have problems now. I don't That's want right. you to get the wrong idea because uh, in this life we will have tribulation. Jesus Absolutely. said that. You're going to have tribulation, but there's something on the inside of you that produces joy, Hallelujah. and it's the, it's the Holy Spirit because He's the joy giver. Absolutely. He's the joy giver, and I think what joy comes from is looking at our problems and saying, ha ha, laughing because they know what my God is bigger than that absolutely you know I was one of the ladies in our church and she's a dear soul and uh, she sends out texts every once in a while to encourage others in the, mm -hmm. in the church and she says something about she was really struggling to work on change and I texted her back and I said um, you know rather than try to work on change don't don't focus on yourself just focus on the Lord and his goodness and let him do the transformation in you. Absolutely. Lord is God which worketh in us both to will and to do of his good yes. pleasure. And you know, one of the things that I, I want to encourage people today, Roland, part of my message is, is understanding that we don't have to work everything out. That's right. Part of what we have to do is get to the place where we win the battle in the mind. Because what God told That's me it. one day was, if you get your mind right, you can get your money right. You can get your health right. You can get right relationships. Yes. It starts with the mind. And sometimes we approach it the wrong way. That's why the, the word of the, the Lord says, let this mind be in you, which was also Amen. in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus had problems. The Bible says he was in at all points tempted, which means everything we've been tempted right. by and tested by, he was tested. But his mind was so focused on giving glory to God. His mind was so focused on his purpose. His mind was so focused <laughs> on bringing us back into right relationship with him that even when he was in the greatest peril of his life, he still was focused on his purpose. His mind was still right. That's oh, why when wow. he was stretched on the cross, yeah. his mind was still on us because That's he didn't right. even let us be the deterrent from his purpose. And what I think that we have to really understand is that what we have to change first is not where we go, what we say. We have to change our mind How back to the mind of Christ. Amen. And that's why the Bible says uh, 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 um, that we have to really, uh, and, and I'm paraphrasing, we have to really get control of our mind yes. and deliberately give it back to Christ. There we go. That's the, that's the liability of free will. Is It, it gives us a choice yes. to be able to think like God or think like us. Yes. And I don't know about you, Roland, but every time I think like me, things get messed up. <laughs> but when I put on the mind of Christ, yes. not only does he give me the strategy to move forward in my purpose, but he also gives me the strategy on how to get away from what caused me the problem that there I'm you in. Go. And it lets me know that I am, hallelujah, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And when God made me, I, I'm, I'm getting excited, again, he made me with a delicious, deliberate purpose and he put what did he tell Jeremiah before I formed you I knew you I knew and you. I sanctified right. you before you went through one issue before you had one problem before one person talked about you so if you want to change the thing you have to change is change back to God's way of thinking and when you think like him you'll walk like him and when you walk like him you'll go places that he goes and when you go places that he goes you'll meet the people that you need to amen. meet and everything will connect to each other amen it says be renewed in the spirit of your mind and it's not just what we think but it's why we think the way that yes, we do. Sir. And I think the two things that our thinking's got to be corrected on is what we think God thinks of us. That's it. And, and then what we think of ourselves. Those are the two most significant things. Well, with the time that we've got left, Pastor Simran, I would like for you to share a little bit about your church family, right. your, your vision or your mission statement, and what some of the ministries are that your church offers. Okay, okay. Uh, my church uh, that I serve in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the Living Waters Kingdom Church, I need to say this first, is the greatest church this side of heaven. Amen. There is no better church anywhere, <laughs> I'm convinced, and I won't be convinced uh, any other way until Jesus comes back and tells me himself face to face. <laughs> but I, I pastor a wonderful church there in Cedar Rapids, uh, a great gathering of ordinary people with supernatural purpose. One of the things that I always say about Living Waters, and I want everyone to understand this, is Living Waters is a church um, that has flaws. It has issues. And Roland, you know one of the things that I love about that is because if the church can acknowledge that it has flaws, then yes. flawed people can know that that's the church for them. Yes. And I think sometimes people come into churches and they think that everything is going to be perfect, that everybody is going to be uh, great, but it is a hospital. And Living Waters is one Amen. of the greatest hospitals in Healing Cedar Rapids. And, and one thing that I always tell people about Living Waters is when you come to Living Waters, don't be uh, um, dissuaded or, or confused or taken back because people have germs there. We've never walked into a hospital and been mad at people in the rooms for being sick. Oh, that's awesome. And so what Living Waters is, is it's a gathering of imperfect people. And I tell people this, too. And this is the, one of the models of our church is there is no perfect church, 
but there is a church perfect for you. Yes. And so Living Waters, we endeavor to just do real ministry. Uh, we, don't, we don't get caught up in a whole lot of, uh, of, of the, the pomp and circumstance. We just believe in praising God yes. and serving each other. One of the things that you alluded to is that every person that is a part of Living Waters is expected to minister. The word minister does not have a, 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 a preaching overtone as much as it does a serving overtone. Serving overtone. And the thing that we have to understand is the church is there to serve. Now, I've had to redefine what serving is. Sometimes serving doesn't mean giving a handout. Serving means giving accountability. Sometimes serving means pushing you towards purpose, that, which might not necessarily push you in a good direction for your feelings. Yes. And so Living Waters, we endeavor to make people better, to grow people, and we endeavor to grow together. Because, you know, this, this walk can get challenging sometimes. And it's good to know that we have other people that we can lean on. Uh, we are a very um, uh, deliberately Pentecostal church. We do believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but we are not an exclusionary church. So we're not a church where anybody cannot feel like they're a part of it. Yes. We have people from all denominational backgrounds. Uh, we have people from all walks of life, multi-generational, multi-ethnic. I'll tell you one thing about our church is when you come in, you, you, you won't be able to classify it as a certain type of church. Right. The Lord told me something when I started uh, Living Waters uh, almost seven years ago now. He said, if everyone is around you, everyone ought to be among you. And what happens with the church is uh, we have become an exclusionary and, and a very... Uh, um, 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 uh, compartmentalized group, but we're for one body in Christ. Yes. Amen. Everybody ought to be able to come in and find Christ. And so my, my goal at Living Waters is to create an atmosphere that is ministry conducive, uh, which means that if somebody comes in off the street, we pray for them. We don't, they don't have to wait till a certain time in the service. We let the Holy Spirit have his way. Now, oh, we wow. do have certain structural elements that you will see at Living Waters. We, we have a great music department. We have a great ministerial uh, staff. We have great people. But we are open to the move of God. If God comes in and says, hey, shut down your agenda, there's only one agenda. And that is, that is his agenda. <laughs> That's right. I'll tell you one of the things that I, I, a great testimony, I, I know I, I can get along with it, uh, but a great testimony of Living Waters is one Sunday we were having a service um, at our church and God, the power of God was really moving and the power of God really just shut down our regular scheduled programming. And we let God have his way. All of a sudden, a big group of guys came in and um, the Lord led me to, to just deal with a simple message and we called the altar call. All of those guys came to the front wow. and gave their life to the Lord. Now that's a miracle on its own. Yes. But let me tell you what they told me afterwards. They came in my office and they said, Pastor, we wanted to let you know we are members of the Aryan Brotherhood. So by rights, even the idea that they came into a, a church with a lot of African-American people was already a struggle for their beliefs and all this kind of stuff. And what they told me was they said, we were on our way to a meth lab to get some drugs. We were on our way to go do some physical harm to some people. But the noise we heard on the outside of your church drew us in here. Oh, wow. And every time we got ready to move, we, it felt like we were just planted here. And what happened was, as they sat in my office, tears started to flow down their faces. And they say, today we give our life to the Lord. We're getting out of this thing. We know we're going to have some, some physical things that are going to happen as a result. The leader gave me a knife that he told me had bodies on it. He said, I've killed people with this blade, I don't want to do this anymore. Today the Lord told me I'm called to ministry, I'm called to preach, and he said, through your ministry today, God has released me into the purpose that I've tried to bury for years. Oh, my. And so when I say you Living Waters Kingdom Church is, is, is my favorite church, it's because the power of God really, and we're not the only ones, we're not the only church that is preaching the gospel, but I'm glad that we're one of them. Wow. You know, uh, J Jesus is still doing miracles today. That was a miracle. Yes, sir. That was a miracle. It was something that no man could do or orchestrate or set it up, and you didn't even know it was going to happen. God just showed up. Absolutely. And I, and I could tell that you're very sensitive and aware to the fact that when God is there and he wants to do something, you step back and, yes, sir. as you said, give up your agenda. I was looking, uh, and I wanted the website for uh, Pastor Cimarron's church is on the, on the screen there for you to go to their website. I want to encourage you to go there. Uh, that's an experience in itself, mm -hmm. is to go to your website, and the way it opens up is just incredible. And, 
And so you get to know if you're living in the Cedar Rapids area or anywhere around Cedar Rapids, so you get to know who this man of God is and what his ministry is about and, and the people that attend his church. And I noticed this at all the different ministries that you have. There is a place for every person Absolutely. that comes into that church. And another thing I would want to add to, and I know you agree with this, is that you don't have to get all cleaned up and fixed up to be ready to serve. Not at all. God will use you the moment you come to His Son, Jesus Christ. He will say, okay, put you to work, start you out in the ministry of helps or serving. But the thing that I noticed is that, for, for example, your culinary ministry, mm -hmm. lead servants. You know, it's not uh, the director or the manager. or the. It is Absolutely. the lead servant. They're all servants but somebody has to do the leading and take charge a little bit. Yes, sir. And I, I thought, that is great. And every category of ministry you have, it lays out the people within the church that are involved in that ministry, and it, and it gives them, uh, the, rather, the lead servant, the person that has the responsibility to keep that moving. Absolutely. That's a, a great title to have, isn't it? Lead well, servant. And it's to remind us that that's what we're about. It's not about being important. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that, that troubles me about the church world today is that so many people are trying to be important and nobody remembers that there's only one that's important. That's right. And if we can't serve people, we're not reflecting the one that we say we serve. Yes. And so when we, uh, our lead servants at our church, they, they get a lot of accountability. They get a lot of, yeah. of, of, of that kind of thing from me, but I never want them to forget that we are here to serve people. Yes. And, you know, we cannot be so oriented towards building a church that we don't build the church that is the individuals that we come in contact with every day. Yeah. And I believe that if we're ever going to win the world, it's not going to be through church service. It's going to be through serving. Amen. You know, what, every book of the Bible, the New Testament especially, is my favorite. But I think Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is my favorite favorite okay. because uh, it really tells us who we are as children of God and believers in Christ and it goes on to talk about what the church is. Yes. The church is, is not a building or a denomination, it's people. And Absolutely. in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about our calling. Absolutely. We all have a calling. And so in the couple of minutes that we have left, Pastor Simran, share with them about what some of those ministries are that people uh, can connect with. I know one of them is evangelism. You do mm -hmm. outreach in the city and... We have a, a tremendous amount of ministries. We have evangelism and outreach, which deals with um, getting out into the streets as well as serving people's needs that come to the church mm -hmm. uh, because we can't expect everyone to come in. Sometimes we've got to go out yes. to reach those. Jesus said, go you into the world. Don't yes. wait for the world to come to us. We have a culinary ministry that, that serves food because one of the things that I look at, every time Jesus had something major to say to his disciples, he did it over a meal uh. because sometimes it's hard to concentrate on the right things when you're hungry. Just, just the natural, then the spiritual. Uh, we have uh, youth ministry, Kingdom Generation Youth Ministry. We have Children's Church. We have an awesome music ministry. There, there's a place for everyone. And, and like Roland said, you will, you will never be good enough to deserve to serve God. That's right. None of us are good enough. None of us are great enough. None of us are so wonderful. But the thing about a church is, and this is what Living Waters endeavors to be, is a church where you can find your place. Because in Nehemiah it said that the wall got com uh, completed because the people had a mind to work. Everybody played exactly. their part. Exactly. And don't worry about what you wear. Last Easter I preached in shorts and a hoodie. So there are no dress uh, attire <laughs> requirements. Come as you are, and I believe you will not leave like you came. Praise God. Well, thank you, Pastor Simran. I think that you've already seen, heard enough to say, I've got to pay a visit to that church. Amen. And uh, the, you, the service times and ministry times mm -hmm. are posted there. And I do know that on your website that it indicates you have a women's ministry. Yes, sir. And men's ministries. And those are very significant and important. And also uh, youth ministry, which includes children. Absolutely. And so there's, there's uh, many ministries that are available and offered and there's many ministries available for you to become a part of. And so let me say this in closing this segment of the program. You don't have to get right with God. Amen. You just have to come to Him just as you are. Amen. And I was one of those people who thought I had to quit this and, and quit that and start this and start that and all that. And, and you know, it's only through Christ that we can come to the Father anyway. And so if you just come to Christ just the way you are, and present yourself to Him and let Him do the work of transformation in you. And as far as your calling goes, you just come see 
Pastor Simran. Amen. And, and I believe that you already know what you have in your heart to do for the glory of God. Stay tuned now as, as Pastor Simran brings you a very inspirational message and points the way to Christ. Amen. God bless you. Uh, I'm Pastor Simran Dawson, the proud lead pastor of Living Waters Kingdom Church. And I'm so glad to be able to share just a, a, a word of encouragement with you um, uh, on this broadcast uh, concerning who we are in Christ and who we're called to be. A lot of times I believe that we, we jump over the idea of character when it comes to our relationship with God. We want to get the blessings and the benefits of a relationship with God but there are some things that we are called to. There are some things that have to be a part of who we are if we're really going to maximize the potential of our relationship with God. And I want to deal with just a couple of quick passages of Scripture. Uh, um, Proverbs 16, uh, verse 3 says, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts shall be established. I'm going to connect that uh, for our brief time together with 2 Kings chapter 2. Um, 2 Kings chapter 2, um, starting at verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, wait here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? Hallelujah. And he said, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. Elijah said unto him, I'm in verse 4, Elisha, wait here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Verse 5 says, And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away your master from his head today? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said to him, Wait here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And they too went on. One of the things that God wants me to talk to us today about is the blessing of commitment. The blessing of commitment. We live in a society today where people struggle to be committed to anything for very long. Usually we, we uh, are good starters, but we have trouble finishing. You know, I, I can honestly say many times uh, I'm very ambitious at the start of a thing. But it's a struggle sometimes to remain committed. Committed doesn't mean that you're just working towards something, but committed means that you're willing to give the effort that is required to do it to the maximum uh, extent of your ability. Uh, commitment oftentimes is the difference between the haves and the have-nots. One of my favorite quotes is that successful people do every day what unsuccessful people do occasionally. And isn't that like most of us? We, we, we have a lot of dreams. We have a lot of ambitions. And the problem is not uh, the, the idea of where we're going. The problem is what we have to do in the process. And many of us struggle with the idea of commitment. Now, as I said just a moment ago, it's never hard to stop, to start things. Excuse me. It's never hard to start. Uh, many of us, if we look back over our year, we made New Year's resolutions or whatever you want to call them. Um, about what we were going to accomplish this year. Uh, you know, most of us every year say, this is the year I'm going to lose weight. And it's easy to say that until your favorite foods are in plain view. It's easy to say, I'm going to, make, I'm going to go to the gym every day and work out until it's inconvenient to get up early, until it's inconvenient to drive, until you have something else that you want to do. It's really easy to say I'm going to make some significant changes in the way that I do things. The problem comes that, uh, with the fact that commitment, first of all, takes a mental uh, commitment to follow through. Uh, I would be committed better in certain areas of my life if I would keep the motivation in plain view and I would continue to follow through. 
Uh, I, can, I can say, honestly, um, part of my testimony is uh, about three and a half years ago, almost four years now, I had a heart attack. And as soon as I had a heart attack, afterwards, I was so committed to doing everything that my doctor told me. I was so committed to eating everything that I hated and not eating a lot of the things that I loved. But over time, I didn't see all of the results happen as quickly as I wanted them to. And so over time, slowly but surely, I found myself reverting back to the old mindsets, reverting back to the old habits. And what happened was my commitment started to struggle. And before I knew it, I went from a place of extreme dedication to partial dedication. Extreme attention to detail with observing all of the rules and doing all the right things to now a place where I gave myself excuses. And with the idea of commitment, we have to be to the place where we continue to follow through even if we don't feel like it. Now, when it comes to commitment, there are three words that stand out that are very important. The three words concerning commitment are process, patience, and perseverance. I'm going to say that again. Process, patience, and perseverance. Process is you committing to trust regardless of what you're going to face uh, in the journey. None of us will go straight from point A to point Z. There will always be challenges and trials and tribulations and uh, surprises that we will face on the journey. And if your commitment is not rooted in the understanding that it will be a process, your strength will fail, your faith will fail, and your actions will follow suit. Many of us, when we said we're starting out with God, when many of us, when we said we were on our way to our dreams, we were on our way to go get our destiny, we did not consider all of the things that we would have to go through in between conception, hallelujah, and, and manifestation. When I first thought about what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be, I just saw myself almost like Star Trek beaming myself to the next place. But in real life, there's going to be a set of circumstances. There are going to be challenges and things that are going to happen. So you have to commit to the process. Number two, you have to commit uh, and you have to execute patience. Uh, and that is the commitment to wait. Everything that's going to happen for you is not going to happen for you overnight. Everything that is going to happen in your life, everything that God is going to do, every place of destiny that you've seen that God has given you a glimpse of is not going to happen as soon as you would like it to. And oftentimes our motivation is drained by the time that we have to wait. And, and sometimes we say, God, why am I waiting? Understand that some of why God uh, causes us to wait is not because the blessing is not ready. It's that we're not ready to, to not only get the blessing, but to keep it. God does not want to keep giving us stuff that our character cannot sustain. And when it comes to the wait, sometimes the wait is God is waiting for certain people to leave your life. Hallelujah. That's why don't fight people when they decide to leave you. Don't get mad when people walk away from you. Just understand that part of what they're doing is cutting down the time of wait. Part of what is happening in your life is God is just saying, I've got to get these people and these distractions and some of these things out of your way so that you can go ahead and reap, hallelujah, what I have had, what I have for you. The other reason why God calls us to, to wait is found in the scripture because they that wait upon the Lord, I wish I had some Bible readers, shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings of eagle. They shall run and not get weary, walk and not faith. Understand that part of why you have to commit to waiting is because God is going to do something bigger and better in you. You have to understand that if you never had to wait, you would have never learned how to fly. If you never had to wait, you would never learn how to rely, hallelujah, on God and not everybody else. If you never had to wait, you would never have had to, hallelujah, get your mind to a place where you can believe God in spite of your circumstances. So when you commit to wait, you are committing to God elevating your character, 
elevating who you are and you're committing to let God do his perfect work in you. The third word is perseverance. Perseverance doesn't just mean enduring, but it means committing to fight. Hallelujah. And sometimes in life with what God has for you and the magnitude of what he's going to do in you and the magnitude of what he has for you, you've got to get a little fight in you. Now understand, God doesn't want us to fight people, but he does want us to fight for our family. He doesn't want us to fight people, but he wants us to fight for our dreams. He doesn't want us to fight people, but he wants to fight us to fight for our ministry. And what happens is you have to commit to fighting through obstacles. Satan is never going to just lay down and let you just be all that God has for you to be. He's not going to ever just lay down and let you have what he even knows you can have. But you got to get to a place where you say, even though we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that I'm going to put on the full armor of God that I might be able to not only stand, but I can be able to fight and I'd be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy and I'd be able to do what God has called me to do. So you got to commit to process, commit to patience, commit to perseverance. It's also, watch this, very important. I need to, I need to stop and put a pin here. You've got to understand that your commitment can never be about or, or be subject to your past or the present because nothing in your past or your present will be good enough in certain moments to make you feel like it's worth you continuing to do what you need to do. That's why your perseverance, your patience, and your process has to be rooted in the fact that there is a future that is coming. And the reason why I stay committed, the reason why I challenge you to stay committed, even when you're in your rough seasons of life, is because you have to understand that the, the, the Word of God tells us that, that uh, I reckon that the present suffering shall not compare to the glory that will be revealed in us. Which means if you can stay committed, even though it's rough right now, there's a future that's waiting on you that's tied to your commitment. There's a future blessing that is waiting on you that is tied to you holding on. Which means don't let your past and what you've been through be the reason why you quit before the finish line. Don't let what you're going through even right now be a deterrent to you because sometimes you got to have enough faith not to believe what you see, but to begin to see what you believe and begin to hold on in the face of what's going on right now because you can see yourself in the future. If I was at Living Waters, I would say, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I see you in the future and you look so much better. And if you can just commit, if you can just hold on, there is a future revelation that is going to make your present and your past worth everything you've been through. Now, another thing that commitment can never be about is commitment can never be about the rewards and benchmarks that you decide. In other words, you can't say I'm being committed and Lord, you ought to give me what I want because I'm committed. You cannot say I'm being committed and you need to pay me a certain way in a certain time frame, otherwise I'm giving up. Because understand, God knows his whole process for us. And, and if we decide in our own mind what we need for being faithful, we will miss what God is really trying to do. I remember when I was younger, there were many ideas that I committed myself to that were good ideas when I had a limited understanding. They were good ideas when I had limited resources. They were good ideas based on having limited relationships. And what happened was a lot of the things that I was trying to get uh, out of my process was really beneath my privileges. Understand that sometimes God has to, in the process of your life, upgrade your understanding so that you realize that what you would have settled for is not his best for you. Hallelujah. I understand that even things that are good are not necessarily God. Things that are, 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 are better than what I have doesn't mean that's what God has for me. And that's why when you commit, you have to say, God, I'm committing to trusting you all the way. It's your word that is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It's not my agenda because because my agenda might be hallelujah wrong. My agenda might be misguided. What I think I want, again, God might not be good for me. I, I wish, I wish that sometimes that I would know the very uh, to, or the totality of God's plan. If God would give me a glimpse and let me know and, and have a no, let's just say it like this: If He would have a meeting with me and tell me what He was doing in my process, if God would have a meeting with me and tell me everything that's happening for my good, if God would show me 
what he's got for me, then I would be okay. But sometimes you've got to have enough faith to say, God, I trust you. In you, I live, move, and have my well-being. I got to believe that Jeremiah 29, 11 is absolutely true, that he knows his thoughts concerning me. They are thoughts of peace, not of evil, and they are to bring me to an expected end. What is the expected end? God expects that I win, so I need to expect that I win. God expects that I'm blessed, so I need to expect that I'm going to be blessed. God expects that I will walk in supernatural, overwhelming favor, so that's what I have to believe too. And so I cannot get caught up in not getting my way from day to day. Also, I have to have enough faith. I remember when I was, I was younger too, uh, with my mom, I would say, Mom, I need money to go to the game on Friday. And I would ask her on a Monday. And on Tuesday, I would see my mom go to the grocery store and spend money. And I would say, Mom, remember, I need money on Friday to go to the game. On Wednesday, I would see my mom have to put gas in her car. And I would say to myself, Mom, and then I would not just say to myself, I would say to her, I'd say, Mom, hey, don't forget, I need money on Friday. Thursday would come, and I would see my mom have to spend money on miscellaneous things. And I would constantly, in my mind, stress, so I would ask her again, Mom, don't forget, hallelujah, that I need money on Friday. And I remember one Thursday that I got on her nerves, I think that last time, she said to me, I know what I have to do concerning you on Friday. So no matter what you've seen all week, you've got to remember that if I made a promise on Monday about Friday, I've already considered all of this other stuff in the process. And I feel like I'm preaching to somebody. That's why you can't be discouraged about what's happening in the Tuesday of your life. If God made a promise to you on Friday, be faithful and trust him. You don't always have to look in on him. You don't always have to doubt him. You don't have to uh, second guess whether commitment is going to pay off. You just got to understand that if God made you a promise, which I know some of you can say God made me a promise. And if he made you a promise that he would take care of you, if he made a promise that he would honor you for your commitment, you've got to trust him. And, and listen, the, the word of God helps us trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Because when you start leaning on your own understanding, you say to yourself, this is for no reason. When you lean on your own understanding, you say to yourself, it may not be worth it. But when you trust in the Lord with all your heart, you realize that God is not a man that he should lie. You also realize that he that has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, which means that if you are committed, he's going to absolutely do his part. Now, um, for the believer... When you commit, there are some things that are very important. You have to commit the way you see things. You have to commit the way you do things. You have to commit the way you speak on things and about things. You have to be committed in who and what you choose to connect with and the relationships that you build. You have to commit on how you spend and in how you spend your free time. You've got to commit to preparation. You don't just show up and just do something. You've got to commit to preparing for it. You have to commit to make an investment. Understand that anything that God has for you is going to require an investment from you. And you've got to commit to invest. I'm talking to somebody who struggles in finances. You have to be able to commit to investing in your future, not getting caught up in trying to be happy in the present. Understand that what God has for you, even as it relates to your material life, is going to require an investment from you a committed investment you have to commit to pray because you have to commit to hearing God's voice every step of the way because if God doesn't speak your room for error increases exponentially then you have to commit to studying many of us in the body of Christ don't even know what to believe about God because we don't study his word I challenge you to not take just the word of the preacher but understand that you can study to show yourself approved a workman that need not be ashamed able to rightly divide the word of truth and with all the craziness and false teachers that are around you've got to commit to studying the word of God consistently so that you are not led astray now, what does that have to do with the text? Proverbs said, commit your ways to the Lord and they will be established. And then we see over in 2 Kings, Elisha was hanging out with Elijah. And, and what we have to understand is there was underlying tension in the text because Elisha said, Elijah, I've been watching God do great things through you. And I want you to pass on 
your mantle, your anointing to me. Elijah said something that's very interesting. He said, you ask a hard thing. And, and, and part of what he was saying was, I don't know if that's for me to give you because that is something uh, that, that's taken up with God. And if I just was putting a pin here, I would say, don't ever think, hallelujah, that you can ask a man to give you something that God did not agree to give you. Hallelujah. God knows what he has for you. God knows what he wants to do for you. It is our right to connect with people, but you got to go to God for yourself and understand that what God has for you, it is for you. Well, Elijah didn't leave Elisha without hope. He said, he said, hey, man, I can't promise it to you, but he said, if, if you just be faithful, if you are there when I'm translated, if you are there when, when, when God takes me up, I believe you'll have what you ask. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited already because what I understand Elijah was saying to Elisha is, if you be faithful over a few things, God will make you a ruler over many. And so in the text that we read earlier in, in chapter 2, Elijah, Elijah was being challenged to go places where his life was on the line. And Elisha, every time, was challenged with the idea of, do I go or do I stay? Elijah was trying to be, do right by Elisha. And he said, he said hey, man, do, don't go with me on this one just in case. But Elisha said, wherever you go, I'm going to be there. And wouldn't it be awesome if we had that kind of relationship with Christ? Wherever you're going, I'm going to be there, regardless of how I feel, regardless Regardless of how I might think it might put things in jeopardy for me, in spite of how it might be uncomfortable, in spite of what people say. Because, you know, you got to watch the people that are talking in your ear because sometimes they will discourage you with words that make you think that commitment is not a good choice. But hallelujah, sometimes you've got to just know inside of yourself that if God called me to it, if God called me to be committed, he will work out the details. And so they walked together, and, and what happened was... Um, um, Elijah continued to come out all right with Elisha by his side. And sometimes a good thing about commitment, especially as it relates to, to serving others, uh, is, is the commitment will produce character in you So because you'll see demonstrated character and God will grow you up for what you even ask for. People always talk about, I want more anointing, I want more stuff. Well, God has to grow you up first and he grows you up best through commitment. So now purpose led him into drama. Eventually what happened was, uh, uh, is Elijah had his moment with God where he was ready to be translated, taken up. And Elisha was there, committed. And I came to let you know that there is a blessing in being in the right place at the right time. And being committed to God will never cause you to miss a moment. Hallelujah. It's only disobedience where we miss moments. Elisha was positioned in the right place. And as a result, he got the double anointing, a double anointing. And what is so great about this, and who's really blessed me about this, is that Elijah did eight major miracles. And at the time of Elisha's death, he had only done 15. So it would seem that he did not get the double portion uh, that he was promised. But if you go on reading the scripture, you understand that there was a body that was laid on Elisha's bones. And the body lived, which was the 16th miracle, which meant because Elisha was faithful, God was faithful to his word. I came to let somebody know that's struggling with commitment, that's struggling with your commitment to your relationship. Maybe even some of you are struggling with committing to a relationship with God. God will never, ever let you be more faithful to him than he is faithful to you. He will never let you be more committed to him than he is committed to you. How committed is God to you? Huh. He's so committed that he loved us so much that he sent his only son. That's a huge commitment. He sent his only son to die for us. And you know what really is, is really a, a, a very humbling thought is we're not even as faithful as we could be, let alone as faithful as we should be. But he committed so much to the idea of a relationship with you that he sent his son to come down through all those generations and love you. Not only love you, but to be an example for you. 
And ultimately what he did was he was so committed that he gave himself up to die for you and me. What is so great about the commitment is that when he stretched across the cross, the reason why it had to be done that way is because God had lost relationship with man or man had lost relationship with God. However you want to look at it, we were disconnected. And Jesus said, I'm so committed to you that I'll be the mediator. I'll be the go-between. I'll take God's hand and I'll take man's hand and I'll bring them back together. That's such a commitment. And if he's that committed to you, why not try to be committed to him? As I get ready to close this message, I want to tell you a story because many of us say, okay, well, I understand the commitment to Christ, but I have such a hard time committing to where I am. There was a man who walked into a, a, a big warehouse where Jesus was, and he had this huge cross on his shoulder. And in this warehouse were crosses of all sizes. And the man took his big cross over to the corner and set it down. Then he walked around and looked around at all these crosses all over the warehouse. All over the warehouse. And he saw these huge crosses everywhere. And when it came time to check out, he looked at Jesus. He said, Jesus, I'm trying to pick out a cross. He said, you know what? I, I need to pick out a cross that's more suited to me. But the reality was, I don't want a big cross. So he looked out of the corner of his eye, he saw a smaller cross over to the right of him. He said, Jesus, that's the one I want. I want that little cross over there. That's the one I want. Story goes, Jesus looked at him and said, sir, that's the cross that you brought in. Commitment is never easy for any of us, but if we commit, I guarantee it will be worth it. I want to pray for us. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the ability to be committed to you, and I thank you for how you're committed to us. I pray for my brother or sister that they would rise up in commitment, that they would honor you, that they would trust you, that they would realize there is a blessing waiting on them because of their commitment. Give them strength. Give them courage to be committed against the odds. Give them courage, hallelujah, to realize that commitment might not feel good now, but it is paving the way for a better tomorrow. I pray for those that are not saved, that they would commit right now to a relationship with Jesus Christ, that they would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead. And that's the commitment that you're waiting for. And once they turn their life over to you, I believe that they have not seen their best days yet, and I believe that their future looks brighter. Thank you for the ability to commit, and thank you for your commitment to us. We love you. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. God bless you, and I hope you were blessed by the word of God.